There's a chorus we sing here in this place, Colorado. It rings from the maroon bells to mile high. From the great sand dunes to the highest town in America. In the birthplace of rodeo and the cheeseburger, where snow melt flows into every glass. We hear it flowing on the breeze above red rocks or drifting way out into the backcountry where the wild things roam. And the air hums with life. It's our anthem to freedom. But listen carefully. One voice has gone missing. A note that rang through our mountains for eons has disappeared. Help us return this voice to Colorado. Renee Askins explains, in the span of less than 50 years, 
Man had systematically, consciously, intentionally killed every wolf in the West. Hundreds of thousands of wolves were killed. Some in the name of protecting livestock, some for their pelts, some because we believed it was our inalienable right, and some just out of cold, hard vengeance and cruelty, a cruelty we so often attribute to the wolf. In Colorado, the last wolf was killed by federal agents in 1945 in Conejos County in the southeast of Hills. Today, conditions in Colorado are not as they were in the late 18 and early 1900s. Today, unlike at the turn of the century, unhealed populations are abundant. Colorado, Colorado has the largest number of deer and elk in any western state, about 700,000. Today, vast areas of Colorado, at least 16 million acres, are protected as public land. Public land on Colorado's West Slope are comparable in size to the Great Yellowstone ecosystem, which supports about 500 wolves on only about 200,000 deer and elk. And today, Colorado faces a public that overwhelmingly favors wolf reintroduction. Science documents what the land is telling us, that ecosystem resiliency is enhanced by restoring and maintaining intact food chains in the face of large-scale environmental perturbations such as climate change. Essentially, by restoring and keeping species populations in check, wolves make ecosystems more biologically diverse and more resilient. Aspen forests and riparian ecosystems in Colorado are Colorado's two most biologically diverse ecosystems. Colorado's aspen forests are declining, and according to the Colorado State Forester, the primary threats are fire suppression and chronic animal overbrowsing. As indicated by studies of wetlands in Rocky Mountain National Park, the cascading effects of resource destruction by overabundant ungulate populations has long-term ecosystem damage. Wetlands have dried and their values have been lost. Beaver have gone and along with them the animals and plants that rely on their ponds. And the carbon sequestration function of wetlands has been dramatically diminished. Oddly enough, wolves keep deer, elk herd and deer herds healthy. Although elk, Colorado has more elk and deer by far than any western state, all is not well. Elk exceed population objectives, in other words, ecological carrying capacity, in over half of Colorado's elk management units. And chronic wasting disease occurs in at least 16 of Colorado's 43 elk herds and in 31 of Colorado's 54 deer herds. As the preeminent wolf biologist Dr. David Meech stated, the preponderance of scientific evidence supports the view that wolves generally kill the old, the young, the sick, and the weak. And further states, based upon everything I've seen over the course of my career, I generally stand behind the assertion that wolves make prey populations healthier. The evidence to support it is overwhelming. So why does wolf restoration struggle? Why do wolves remain restricted to 15% of their historic habitat despite an abundance of suitable habitat, much of it in western Colorado? To quote Norm Bishop, longtime naturalist and educator at Yellowstone National Park, what we are witnessing with wolves is a battle of modern scientific data against entrenched Old West dogma. We are in a time in which data don't appear to matter to those who cling to dogma. The doomsday scenarios predicted when wolves were restored to the northern Rockies have not come to pass. There is no indication they would do so in Colorado either. Wolves have not decimated prey populations. They have not reduced hunter success. They have not negatively impacted the livestock and the ranching industry. Even when ranchers don't use carnivore livestock coexistence strategies, depredations are minimal. According to the USDA, Loss of cattle to wolves in the northern Rockies was 0.03% and 
0.04% of the sheep industry. When non-lethal coexistence strategies are implemented, depredations often go to zero. So what can we expect in Colorado? Montana is a good analog. Confirmed livestock losses to wolves in western Montana, where about 500 wolves live alongside 550,000 cattle and 165,000 sheep, average 50 cattle and 65 sheep per year. We could expect the same in Colorado. What the evidence also tells us is that ecosystems are reinvigorated and biodiversity is enhanced when wolves are present. Predator-prey relationships provide the necessary stability for almost infinite number of species to exist in ecosystems. And Colorado's west slope is ideally suited to wolves. Prey base and public plans are key determinants of suitable wolf habitat. Colorado has both. Opponents of wolf reintroduction often state that Colorado is too settled, that there is no room for wolves. While it's true that Colorado's population is growing, it's also true that according to the state demographer, 84% of Colorado's population will settle on the Front Range, 11% on our western tier counties, and 5% will be divided between these central mountains, the San Luis Valley, and the eastern plains. Importantly, wolves face a Colorado public that overwhelmingly favors wolf restoration. Polling conducted as far back as the 1980s found 71% of Coloradans supported wolf restoration. Polling in March of 20, 2019, this year, established the continued breadth and depth and duration of support for wolves in Colorado with fully 67% of Coloradans supporting reintroduction and only 15% opposing. But wolves cannot get to Colorado on their own. A vibrant population would be an asset, but wolves face a human cultural gauntlet in Wyoming with too many mortal hazards for a sufficient number of wolves to wander Colorado, find one another, and survive long enough to give birth to the countless litter of pups needed to give rise to a viable, ecologically effective population of wolves. Restoration is imperative if Colorado is to have any chance of an ecologically effective population. Now is the time to reject the old model of domination and embrace instead a paradigm of coexistence and stewardship, a paradigm long known by Native Americans. As told in the Southern Ute story of creation and translated by Alden Naranjo, Southern Ute elder, Sunaway, the wolf, is the big brother of Yaguvich, the coyote, the mischievous little brother. Ute people use Sunaway as the creator or God, or grandfather. Colorado stand ready to achieve a breakthrough decades in the making. Restoring the great wolf, and in so doing, beginning the journey to restoring a natural balance to the wild lands of Colorado's west slope. The Rocky Mountain Wolf Action Fund seeks to pass Initiative 107. Initiative 107 is a grassroots path to wolf restoration, putting the wolf decision directly in the hands of Colorado voters. 107 directs Colorado Parks and Wildlife to restore gray wolves to Colorado by December of 2023 and directs wolf management be guided by best available science. 107 also directs that ranchers be fairly compensated for livestock losses. So, if you're a Colorado voter, Please consider signing our petition to include Initiative 107 on the 2020 ballot. If you're not a Colorado voter, you can still help restore our to restore the national balance by supporting the Rocky Mountain Wolf Action Fund. Help us restore the how. Help us restore the national balance to Colorado. Thank you so much.